want to begin by saying to all of you that I love teachers. I know that that is something that some people don't believe. And I'll tell you that I've made it public time and time again that yes, I am a teacher and that in fact I got into teaching by accident, fell in love with it and here I am uh, as Minister of Education. But while I tell people that it is by accident that I got into teaching, I'm tempted to think sometimes that it was not so much an accident, that in fact that was by design, maybe not my design, but it was by design. I began my own educational career at Menzies Kindergarten. I was listening as they said that Mrs. Ely is the director at the Eglers Training Center. And if you know where, where Eglers is, that was the home of Menzies Kindergarten. And I enrolled in Menzies Kindergarten in 1980 and began at two years old. Then I moved up the street on the canal side to Queen Square Anglican School, where I was taught in Infant One by Miss Shirley Samuels, in Infant Two by Miss, uh, Mrs. Grant. Can't recall Mrs. Grant's first name. Standard One by Sharon Baird. Standard Two by Geraldine Smith. Standard Three by Stephanie Willis. Standard Four by Juliet Williams, a lady I did not see for many years after she taught me in Standard 4 until I happened upon her as principal of Holy Ghost Roman Catholic School in Bangriga just a few months ago. Standard 5 by Myrna Lewis, Myrna Smith Lewis. And Standard 6 by, I'm sure all of you know, uh, Dr. Carol Bob. And my other Standard 6 teachers were Mrs. Julia Budd, who is now deceased, God bless her. Uh, Miss Ingrid Gladden, who now resides in the USA. And Miss Rita Mejia, who is still active, I think, teaching at the YMCA uh, program on Fathers Road. My high school uh, homeroom teachers, I remember in particular, Dr. Clara Quare from the YMCA. Mr. Eric Neal my second form homeroom teacher. And my third and fourth form homeroom teacher was Valentina Wedderburn Bird. I remember them dearly. I remember all of their names and it's not something that I had to think about for tonight alone. I remember them because they made, all made a mark on my life. Some more than others, I will tell you. But as I tried to think, why is it that they made a mark, I tried to look for commonalities, similarities in what they did, to see if there was a common technique in what they did that made me remember them or made them have the kind of impact that they had on my life. And I will tell you that I could not come up with any particular strategy. I could not remember any particular technique any strategy in education that they, that they did that made me any better or that I can remember them by or that caused me to, to be any better in life as a result. There's no strategy. The things that make me remember them is the heart that they had for me as a student and the love that they displayed for me, the confidence that they had in me as a young student coming up. And so, ladies and gentlemen, when I tell you that I am 100% positive that it is the heart of the teacher that makes that teacher effective, I'm telling you because I know I have lived it, I have experienced it. I'll tell you one little more story, one story more before I get into the prepared text that I have for you. Because we're here tonight not only to honor teachers, we're here also to honor those who uh, lead schools. 
And uh, I think Dr. Bob does a very good job of telling you of the days when she was my standard six teacher and principal. For those of you who have not heard that, uh, she used to whip me, yes. But not for giving trouble, but for, uh, I remember one time I got an 85 on a test and she gave me three cuts with the sash card because I could do better. One cut for every 5% that I missed. And I've forgiven her, don't worry. <laughs> but I wanted to tell you about uh, two other individuals that made an impact in my life over the time. One of them is uh, Father John Jack Stokel, who was headmaster of St. John's College at the time that I was there, and uh, who is very much alive and kicking and around Belize, I think the St. Martin's uh, Roman Catholic Parish now. I remember when I was in second form that I had difficulty seeing the blackboard and I had known for a while that uh, my sight wasn't uh, very good even from primary school but I had gotten a, a free pair of glasses I think from the Lions people and that was somewhere in standard five and of course when I got to SJC I was ashamed to wear the glasses because it, my eyesight was pretty bad those of you who uh, know the term, they call it the Coca-Cola bottle eyeglasses. It was that bad. I took a surgery in 2007, LASIK surgery, and now I, I see unaided. And some say my looks have improved since, huh? <laughs> but by the time I got to second form, those glasses were no more. And I had tremendous difficulty seeing the blackboard. And I remember I was in Jorge Pelayo's uh, math class and he had asked me to work out something that was on the blackboard and I could not see and Mr. Pelayo sent me to Father Stokel and Father Stokel immediately was very sympathetic I don't know how many of you know my background but we were not wealthy at all and he wrote a letter to Dr. David Hoy and the letter basically asked Dr. Hoy to provide me with the glasses that I needed in order to see in the classroom. And in return, Father Stokel asked me to come on Saturdays to take a huge dictionary that he had, a Garifuna dictionary. And I had to take this dictionary to De Angelos on Saturdays to photocopy sections by sections. That is how I got my glasses. And Dr. Hoy showed me the letter many years later when I visited actually for my LASIK surgery. And he was showing me what a long way I had come. And I could not but reflect that it was the kind of the, because of the kind of heart and generosity. I don't think it was Father Stokel's money probably was the school's money but he was the school leader and he made that call and he made that decision to help a student and he had to have the heart and so these are the kinds of people who I'm sure are still very much in our education system today and who have over the many years contributed to the success of students uh, all over. I mean, you know, people will say that, okay, Minister Faber, you are in the spotlight, so your success is evident, and the contributions made by your teachers are evident. But their success is all over Belize, and in fact, all over the world, of the contributions that teachers have made and school leaders have made. And so it pleases my heart this evening to be a part of the celebration. But it pleases my heart at all times to celebrate, to congratulate, and to push teachers so that when I am accused of trying to be difficult to teachers, I hope that they understand and I try to explain every chance that I get that it is not my intention. My mother is a teacher still. And of course, I believe as I've said to you that I'm in this not because 
I wanted to, but somebody had that design for me. I'm sorry, I said I would tell you of a second person. And that person is Dr. Lester Wayne Plumley, who was my economic advisor, my ad academic advisor in my bachelor degree program. Dr. Plumley visited Belize earlier this year for the COBEC conference, and he's now the dean of the College of Business of Alusta State University, where I'm still uh, going to school. And uh, you know, if I have to think about all the teachers I didn't call, uh, those that were in my um, tertiary years, and I certainly would not call the names of the ones now because I have a few bad thoughts about those who are pressuring me now and just finished pressuring me for the work that I handed in for last, the last semester, the current semester that is finishing, I should say. But Dr. Plumley was one as well who assisted me many years ago and didn't think about it. Uh, he knew that uh, the investment that he was making was special. I, I guess he didn't know why, but I took great pleasure in hosting him here in Belize. Uh, I think it was in February and uh, uh, he hopes to visit with his family later on this year. But anyway, I found this story on the internet and I'm not certain if it is true, but here goes. The title of the story is The Best Teacher Ever. And the author is unknown and was published by, the story was published by Pete Barkelou, who cites Dr. Dwayne Dyer as his source. This is a story from many years ago of a primary school teacher. Her name was Mrs. Thompson, and she said, and she stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school. She told the children a lie. Like most teachers, she looked at her students and said that she loved them all the same. But that was impossible because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with the other children, that his clothes were messy and that he constantly needed a bath. And Teddy could be very unpleasant. It got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen, making bold X's and then putting a big fat F on the top of the papers. At the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records and she put Teddy's off until last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He is a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he's troubled because his mother has terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest and his home life will soon affect him if some steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful paper and tied with pretty ribbons, except for Teddy's. His present, which was clumsily wrapped in the heavy brown paper that he got from a grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. But she stifled the children's laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy stuttered stay after, stay after school, stayed after school that day, just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, 
Today, you smell just like my mom used to. After the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she quit teaching, reading, and writing, and arithmetic. Instead, she began to teach children. Mrs. Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy. As she worked with him, his mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class. And despite her lie that she would love all the children the same, Teddy became one of the teacher's pets. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy telling her that she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote that he had finished high school, third in his class, and she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he stayed in school, had stuck with it, and would soon graduate from college with the highest of honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had in his whole life. Then four years passed and yet another letter came. This time he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had, but now his name was a little longer. The letter was signed Theodore F. Stoddard, MD. The story doesn't end there. You see, there was yet another letter that spring and Teddy said he'd met this girl and was going to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple of years ago and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit in the place of the in the wedding at the wedding that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course, Mrs. Thompson did. And guess what? She wore the bracelet, the one with several rhinestones missing, and she made sure that she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other and Dr. Studdard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, thank you, Mrs. Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Mrs. Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back. She said, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that this story speaks to what makes a good teacher. One could argue that at the first, Mrs. Thompson was not a very good teacher at all. It could also be argued that Mrs. Thompson became, in a, very good, became a very good teacher. So what changed in Mrs. Thompson that allowed her to become a very good teacher? That Teddy considered his best teacher ever. In my opening remarks a few days ago at the Biennial Teacher Education Conference held earlier this week, I noted that it is important to have qualifications or to know your content and to have pedagogical skills to be a good teacher. However, I also noted that such is not sufficient for having qualifications or knowing your content and having pedagogical skills is useless if you do not have the heart for children, for your students. That is what changed in Mrs. Thompson, her heart. Teachers, uh, to be good teachers, we must have qualifications. That is the content knowledge and the pedagogical skills. But we must also care deeply about our students. We must love our students. We must realize that we are not merely teaching subjects, but we are shaping lives, helping to form human beings. And as Professor Errol Miller reminded us at the Teacher Education Conference earlier this week, we are also shaping our society. And to shape our society, we must understand ourselves, our role as teachers, and we must understand our students. Some years ago, I came across a poem I believe they shared a bit of it with you earlier. And it also does an excellent job of describing the very important role teachers play in the lives of our young people and in the, life, in the life of our country. 
I will simply quote the first two stanzas of the poem by Paula Fox because I think it says it all. You remember it? The child arrives like a mystery box with puzzle pieces inside. Some of the pieces are missing or broken and others just seem to hide. But the heart of teacher can sort them out and help the child to see and potential for greatness he has within a picture of what he can be. As I reflected on this poem, I am indeed humbled because, as I've said to you, I would not be here standing as your Minister of Education had it not been for the teachers whose hearts sorted me out to help me to see a picture of what I could be. All of us in here can think of those great teachers who helped to sort us out. So we could picture, so we could the picture of what we could be and then helped us to become what we could be. Tonight we are honoring teachers and school leaders whose hearts are turning human puzzles into pictures of what they could be and collectively into a picture of what Belize could be. Let me ask you ladies and gentlemen as I close to join me in giving them a round of applause as we congratulate all of them for the wonderful work that they do. Thank you.